Well, 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 we're back. This is Steve Sanson and Jim Jonas with another episode of Veterans in Politics. Uh, before we go in, before we go into a rants, Jim, and um, I just wanted just to let everybody know that we had two guests today. We had uh, Governor Jim Gibbons, and unfortunately, the the governor is still recuperating and unable to be here in studio or on air. Um, governor does promise to uh, come in sometime in December to uh, to uh, for an interview. So we apologize for that. Um, we're going to have Dave McGowan. He's the field director for Americans for New Leadership. And God knows we need some new leadership out there, huh, Jim? Yeah, well, it looks like we're going to have a little bit anyway. A the little Republicans bit. Republicans took back the House. So. Yeah, they took back the House, but they didn't quite make it, the, didn't quite take back the Senate. Was it one vote short or yeah. something like that? No, and it was kind of surprising. The Tea Party candidates did not do it fair as well in this election as I thought they might. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, if I was a betting man, I, I thought that uh, Sharon Angle was going to pull it off by two points. Yeah, I was a little concerned about that race going into election night just because it was so close. And uh, I heard some rumors around town about some of the um, get out the vote efforts Harry Reid had. So I knew he would turn out big numbers. So I was pretty nervous. Well, I was shocked she lost by 5%, but... Well, I, I'm glad that, what, was a little over 700,000 people um, actually voted? Yeah, it was a good turnout for a midterm. Yeah, that, that wasn't bad. Hey, you know something? I, I'm, I'm happy with some of the races. I remember the, the Constable's race for Las Vegas in the primary. I was happy Bobby Grunauer was ousted out. And you know me, I'm always, I cut right to the chase, say right. the way I feel. And, and, and the, the, the Secretary of State race, I'm just thrilled that Rob Laurie got his butt smashed. Right there with you. I, I don't. I don't even know who the hell went after that guy and put him in the race. Me either. Who who did it's, that? It's something. I, someone. You, someone who liked the bus. You know, I probably think Dave McGowan probably has something to do with that. Put Rob Lauer in that Secretary of State race. What do you think? I know. We'll have to ask him. All right, we'll, we'll we'll ask him a little later. But um, what other races excited you? I I I. I well, let me let me just think. The 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 um race with the uh Jerry Weiss and uh, Michael McDonald for um district court judge that was that was very close yeah it was and then you have Judge Abitangelo he after fourteen years on the bench he he lost his seat yeah well yeah things happen you know but um I, I he said that he was going to get a recount yeah I was happy for uh, Elizabeth Houseth. Elizabeth House said she took it. Well, that, that's a Republican area. Yeah. And you know something? You know, Dave McGowan is the one that really pushed and made sure that she won that primary against Dennis Nolan. Yeah, he did. So if I was Elizabeth House, said I'll, I'll send Dave McGowan a bouquet of flowers or a box of chocolates or something just thanking him. Yeah, I'll, I'll fully admit I was, in the beginning, I did not think uh, she was ready to be a state senator. But after watching a very impressive campaign, I mean, I know Elizabeth personally. I know she's a very... Uh, How personal? Steve, come on. Okay, good. Just, you know, I, I got to ask. You see, you know her personally, uh, yeah, so I'm asking. We're friends. Oh, okay. Good. And uh, I know she's a very, very intelligent woman, but I just thought that she didn't have some of the experience she needed, but she ran a very successful campaign. But you know something? I think she's going to do a wonderful I job. I invited her to come on the show um, during the general, and, and she never showed. So well, I, I don't Maybe know. she just likes me more than you. Well, then she should have uh, showed that, up that just wasn't for you. enough. She should have just showed up just for well, you. What, what did you do to make it to where she didn't want to come on the air? I, I didn't do a doggone thing I there. I, I think I was very nice. <laughs> uh, we, we endorsed her, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So against um, Tom Jones, yeah. the, the Libertarian or Independent or something like that. I forget. Mm. I forget I forget what party uh, Tom Jones is um, um, affiliated with. But, um, folks, we're going to have our raffle drawn at 2.30, and we have uh, three winners, so you probably want to stay tuned for that. I'll call out those numbers at around 2.30. But... Um, you know, Veterans Day is November 11th. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I think that only veterans should have that day off. I agree. Yeah. If, if you can't prove you're a veteran, you should work. I agree. And now, how we're going to enforce that is, I'd like to hear your The, the same way that. we're enforcing illegal immigration. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, exactly the same way. We can't, I guess. <laughs> I guess not. And Marine Corps birthday is coming up November 10th. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to go to that. I went last year. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, Marines are, the Marine Corps is 235 years old on November yeah. 10th, one year older than the nation. We're the oldest fighting force in the United States. Impressive. Impressive. I, I just love those uniforms. Yeah. Are you going to go to the ball? Yeah. You are? Yeah. Oh, did you get the tickets? No, you're going to get them for me. You I am? Yeah. I'll just let you know that right now. Oh, you know, I haven't even got my tickets. Well, hurry up. I, I, I don't even, I don't even, I don't even think... 
I don't even think I'm gonna go. I think after ah, five years, go. after five years of going to the Marine Corps Ball since 2004 here in um, Las Vegas, I had to be specific because I went to many right. others in different countries and different uh, states. Uh, I, I think I probably would sit this one out. I don't know why. Right. I just don't feel the warm and fuzzy the way I used to, you know. Oh, you like those cake cutting events? Do you I, I do yeah. like the cake cutting yeah. events. I see the oldest Marine and youngest Marine. Yeah, that, that's always fun. But um. I want to talk about something that, that's, that's very personal to me. You know, I'm the type of person that I'm very compassionate. Yeah. And, and sometimes I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Yeah. You, you yeah. Do. And, and sometimes, <laughs> you, you know, my, my, my wording comes out the wrong way. Right. And, and, and I, 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 sometimes I, I, I just go direct with what I want to say and just say it. Right. And some people, can't, some people can't understand that. But um, you, know, you know the first... The first of this year, I was arrested. Right. And I was arrested because I was intoxicated and I had two weapons on me, which legally I could carry. Right. Right. The, the only part was is that I was intoxicated with the weapons. Right. Well, I haven't been intoxicated since. Right. I mean, I've been a little buzzed, but never, never, never intoxicated. Right. Not, not like that. And um, I, learned, I learned a valuable lesson from that, Jim. A valuable lesson. Never be intoxicated with your weapons. No. Never. never. Okay. But anyways, regardless, it, it, it probably cost me that election. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, people talk about it. And a lot of people say, you know, well, it, that's, that's going to hurt you. And it probably did. I, I don't know if 100% it did, but it probably did in some form. Um, it cost me 12 hours in Clark County Detention Center. Yeah. Uh, I was, a, I was um, a, a guest of their facilities for 12 hours. It cost me $1,200 in bail, which I got back. Right. It cost me three thousand dollars in uh, legal fees. Matter of fact, I think I'm still paying on that bill. And uh, it cost me suspension of my concealed weapons permit, which I got back. And it cost me time in court and, and scrutiny. Right. You know, and, you know, folks out there, uh, my my family, my family is is um, a family. Well, majority of the family alcoholism runs in that family. Right. I've seen my mother go through it, and my mother attempted suicide twice. I've seen my brother go through it. I have a brother that's in state penitentiary for first-degree murder. He put five bullets in somebody's head. And I, I understand what alcoholism does because I have really, really valuable personal experience when it right. comes to this. And when I see somebody that, that's um, subdued by alcoholism, I... I I say something about it, and how I say it probably is not the way I should have said it, but I say it because I care and because that uh, I'm, I'm concerned and worried. And folks out there, you know, when, you're, when you get intoxicated, um, some people get intoxicated once a year, like, like me. I'm going on a year, okay? Some people get intoxicated every month. Some people get intoxicated every week. Some get intoxicated more than one time a week. Yeah. And when that happens, it puts you in a compromising position because you don't remember half the stuff that happened that day. Right. You, you don't remember what you did, who did what to you. And a lot of people around you think it's a joke, the way you act, the way you walk. Yeah. You can't sit up. You can't walk. When you have to call people up in the middle of the night and people have to come pick you up or hide your keys from you, Right. Or walk you up a flight of stairs or say, hey, you can't go anywhere because you're too drunk to drive. You have a problem. Now, anybody could find a drinking buddy. You and I could go out and drink right now. Right. Be no problem. I, I mean, I, I could go to the bus stop and find somebody to have a couple beers with. But a true friend will say to you, hey, you know what? You need to stop that. You can't come over my house if you're going to be intoxicated. I can't hang out with you. Every time we go and hang out, you get intoxicated. So a true friend will say, stop that. It's time for you to sober up and not drink so much. If you can't drink socially, you shouldn't drink at all. Right. Everybody should know their limits. Like some people, a six-pack, they're good to go. Anything past a six-pack, they're toast. Right. Three drinks, they're fine. If they go four, they're falling down. So everybody should know their limitations. Me, I stop hard, heavy alcohol. Because I know that the gray goose really will sneak up on me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I know that Bacardi is a mother, boy. You know what I'm saying? 
But I could drink Coronas, I could drink a six pack, and I'm fine. Right. Because I know my limitations. And listen, folks, if you really love somebody and you really care about somebody and this person is your friend, hey, you, 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 just, you just have to show them tough love sometimes and say enough is enough. Right. Like my daughter brought the mob over to my house because something she did. Guess what I did? What's that? I kicked her out. Okay. That's how I am. That's my daughter. Yeah. My 19-year-old daughter. I kicked out the house at 1130 at night on a Friday night. Because she brought the mob over to my house because she did something stupid. I kicked her out the house. My oldest son, I kicked out the house a long time ago. Now, me and him are tight as hell. Right. Sometimes there's decisions you got to make in life. That person at the time might not recognize it, might think that you're being an a-hole or whatever. Right. But sometimes you just got to say for the goodness of them. Because you don't want that person to end up in a hospital for... Um, Drinking and driving or, 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 or passing out behind the wheel or killing somebody. You don't want that. Right. Or, or, or passing out in a car in a parking lot and the door is open and somebody come in there and rape them or molest them or rob them or beat them or right. whatever the case might be. You don't want that. When you know that you're going ha- you know to get that call in the morning for you to go pick somebody up and it happens constantly, not like once a month right. or every other month, but every week. Every other week, twice a week, there's a problem. So, folks, if I'm describing you out there, you have a problem. And those other folks, if I'm describing one of your friends out there, you need to step up to the plate and (laughs) and say, look, you know what? I'm doing this for your own good. And that's all I got to say about that. Any comments on that, Jim? No, I was just kind of curious what brought that up, but... uh... It's just a personal thing that happened recently that brought oh, okay. it up, and I just felt the need to say it. Yeah, because because I know I know what alcoholism has done to my family. Right, and then when I witness somebody that's in that same position, yeah, it just brings up my whole history of what right. went on in my life. You know. Yeah. Well, I'm I got some alcoholism that runs in my family too, so I've dealt with those situations too. Tough love, baby. Tough love. This is Steve Sanson and Jim Jonas with Veterans in Politics. We'll be back momentarily with Dave McGowan, Field Director for Americas for New Leadership. of the Veterans Reporter newspaper, the only newspaper in Nevada for veterans and their families. Pick up your free copies at most VA offices, most libraries, at the American Legion, the VFW, the DAV, and hundreds of other locations. We also produce the Veterans Reporter radio show every Thursday night from 8 to 9 p.m. KLAV Radio, AM 1230. And we stream it live at www.klav1230. Com. This is Chuck Ann Baker for the Veterans Reporter Newspaper. For cross schedule and location, log on to takebackyourbelly.com. <laughs> This infomercial is brought to you by the Veterans in Politics International. The Veterans in Politics mission is to teach, educate, organize, and awaken our veterans and their families to select, support, and vote intelligently for a better world and to protect ourselves from our own government in a culture of corruption and to be the political voice for those and other groups that do not have one. Remember, one in six Nevadans are vet. There are too many homeless vet and more programs are needed at the VA. Every veteran service organization should adopt a local homeless veteran. Funding of VA medical centers is inadequate. 
and building a VA hospital in Southern Nevada is moving at a slow pace. The budget has been flatlined for too many years. The VA is too quick to deny claims and too slow to help veterans gather records in support of claims. Local politicians ignore veterans and their issues. They perceive a lack of organization among their local veterans and that it won't hurt them at election time. The veterans too often vote party, not veterans' issues. All veterans should vote in every election. Local news media give inadequate coverage to local veteran issues and events. You must send your letters to the editor and voice your concerns. Please contact your members of Congress and Senate and urge them to co-sponsor key legislation in supporting our veterans. Please support the Veterans in Politics. To get more information, go online to www.veteransinpolitics.com. Support your local veteran groups. This is Steve Sanson Jim Jonas with Veterans and... Well, folks, we are back. And don't forget, in 15 minutes, we're going to call out those three numbers for you. But let's go right over to Dave McGowan, Field Director for Americans for New Leadership. Dave, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Steve. Uh, I want to thank you and Jim for having me in here today, giving me a chance to talk about an organization I'm very proud of. All right, Dave, why don't you give us a bio about yourself? Well, bio about myself, uh, I've been involved in Nevada politics for six years. I started in 2004 with uh, the Bush-Cheney campaign in the Nevada Republican Party. Uh, then got involved with the county Republican Party. Was there a number of years, was a political director for a, a couple of years up until June of 2009. Uh, then I started a political consulting business after I left, the 525 Group campaign management, voter database systems. Uh, during the primary season was involved. We had clients, Sue Loudon, uh, Michelle Fiore, Elizabeth Halseth, some other races. Uh, after the primary, I was recruited to be involved with Americans for New Leadership and spent most of the rest of my time this general election working on projects for that organization. Well, I got to commend you on a couple of your races. Um, I know Michelle Fury, she was in the um, state Senate uh, District 9 race. Yes, sir. Pulled out of that race and uh, went in the Congressional District 1 race and, and came in second. And she was one of the late filings. I um, beat uh, um, Craig Lake and all the others that was in that race. And then you had Elizabeth Housett, who was running in AD 13, and went into the um, state Senate uh uh, nine race and 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 now she's going to be sworn in as a state senator and you you had a lot to do with that so i mean uh, you are a, a very strategic type of guy and and i've been around with you long enough to know that you you think about how to how to kind of um combative you, you like like combat you're you're in there trying to win the war and trying to figure out how the enemy works and trying to work around and, and use their own weakness against them type of deal. So that, that's the type of strategic guy you are. Am, am, I, am, I, am I right about that? Uh, strategic, yeah. I just have a tendency to take things personally. Um, I made a promise to myself when Senator Nolan voted with the Democrats on the massive tax increase and government spending increase that I would do everything in my power to make him hold him accountable for that vote. That vote went against everything I believe is a Republican. So when I had a chance to work with Michelle, uh, who I believe is an awesome candidate and a true conservative, I saw the opportunity when she made the decision she made. Elizabeth was, you know, courageous enough to step up and give us a conservative voice in that race. And I was really thrilled on primary night to kind of make good on that promise I made to myself. Do you, do you think that if you kept Elizabeth in AD 13, she would have won that race? You know, that's, that's a question. That's something I thought about a lot after, uh, after the primary. Because I have a feeling Michelle would have taken State Senate 9 without a problem. Oh, yeah, they were both phenomenal candidates. I mean, they would have taken the race in the primary. They would have taken the race in the general. Um, you know, Scott Hammond kind of came out of nowhere. He didn't spend a lot of money, but he, he you know, he, he, he did it the old-fashioned way. He knocked a million doors. I think Elizabeth and Scott Hammond reached out to a lot of the same kind of voters who have the same kind of issues and the same kind of concerns. So I, I feel if Elizabeth had stayed in the race, they might have fractured the vote, and we would have got a little bit less than a true conservative come through somebody who wasn't committed to not raising taxes and doing those things. 
So, you know, I think it, it pretty much all worked out for the best. I mean, we have a fantastic Assembly 13 uh, Assemblyman-elect in Scott Hammond, and we have a strong conservative uh, state senator-elect in Elizabeth Houseth. So it was a conservative win in both races. So how do you feel about these races that, that, that just um, – we, we just elected these new folks. How do you feel about them? What, what race really – really um strike strike you come to mind or what race were you feeling really you know because you said you're a compassionate type of person you take things personal what what race was really personal to you out there uh well obviously i mean i've been waiting for a chance for six years to try to get rid of harry reed you know i was and this was the best year to do it yeah i was new to the game in 2004 and thought you know when i got in that we had a shot and realized early on we didn't I thought we had a shot now. Uh, you know, I thought we had a shot this cycle to, to take him out. I thought this was the year. You know, it's a majority leader. It hasn't been done in almost 60 years. Everything's got to line up. You know, we came up short. Uh, that one I took personal and all the state senate races. You know, we had phenomenal conservatives that really carried the message. You know, we had Mike Roberson. We had Barbara Sagaski. We had Elizabeth Halseth go out there and really sell a conservative message in districts that actually the Democrats were ahead in voter registration. Yeah. And we're not just fighting so much their opponents, but Stephen Big Dollars Horsford and those garbage mailers that they flood with and the Harry Reid and the Dita Titus turnout machine. And I was really proud to see them go out there and sell a conservative message to the voters. What was the... What uh, Dave, you've been around politics for, like you said, Nevada politics for six years, and I know you're very knowledgeable in politics. What to you defines a good candidate? What does a candidate really need to have to be considered a good, strong candidate? Um, well, I mean, obviously you have to have a pedigree that voters can look at and find trust in. I think they have to find a connection. I mean, why did Elizabeth win? I think you look at Elizabeth, you look at her family. They're the Senate 9 family. You know, they're a small business owner, a husband, three kids, PTA, church volunteer. That's what people identify with in Senate District 9 against a well-funded jewelry store owner, you know, huge house, fast cars, not something people connect with. So you have to have that pedigree that people connect with. Then you have to have a message. That, that and, and, and the photo of him wasn't very um, family-oriented either. No, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> absolutely not. And then once you, you know, once you kind of put that in a candidate, they have to have a message that people connect with. And all of our, I think, all the Republican candidates did a great job of coming out with that message. We cannot, whether it's in Washington or in Carson City, just spend money because we want to, just spend money because we think we need to. We can only spend the money that we have. And so I think you know it's, it's a combination. There has to be a pedigree there, no matter how great the message is. And uh, no matter how great the pedigree is, there has to be a message there that people connect with. So I think we had a lot of luck at putting those two things together this cycle. Do you think if Michelle Fury was to um, uh, win the GOP nomination in the primary, she would have possibly beat Shelley Berkeley? I think, again, that would have given us, you know, no disrespect to Ken Wagner. I mean, I know Ken. Ken served his, his, you know, his country with honor. I, I don't, you know, I don't mean to, to belittle him at all, but... You know, it's kind of the same action expecting a different result. You know, I think this would have been, I think Michelle could have been a really good contrast to Shelley, a small business owner who's created health care jobs, who's done some of the, you know, some of the things that people are concerned about. But the bottom line, the Reed campaign spent so much money and we saw such an increase in their effort to turn out voters in CD1 that all due respect to Michelle, I don't think it was our year. What about the uh, U.S. Senate race? Well, I mean, you had an amazing thing happen. I mean, you had one of the worst pol one of the worst public servants run one of the best campaigns ever. I mean, Harry Reid is not about serving the interests of Nevada. He's about serving the interests of the National Democrat Party. He showed that time and time again. Supporting a health care bill his constituents didn't want, spending his constituents didn't want. But they were able, with their resources and their campaign team, to get out of the gate. Primary election night with websites and with the message, Sharon's extreme, Sharon's crazy. You should be, shared, you know, you should be scared of Sharon. She's going to do this. She's going to do that. Things that aren't true, you know, things that Sharon's not going to do. But he was able to get out there and pound that message, and you saw Sharon's negatives climb. 
You know, and you can do something with undecided voters in a race, but yeah. you can't really bring back a negative. You can't really walk back a negative. When her negatives got to where he was, you know, the race was in a really bad position for us. So, uh, you know, I give his campaign staff major credit for that. I mean, they made an extremely unpopular person a little bit less unpopular than somebody. I mean, it was never about Harry. It was never about what he's done. They don't talk about his record. What's his record? Massive unemployment, massive spending, a health care bill nobody wants. You know, they never talked about that. They talked about Sharon will take this away. Sharon will hurt this. Sharon doesn't like that. You know, and they were better at that kind of campaign than, than our side was. Dave, do you think this race would even, even been close if Sue Loudon or Danny Turkini would have taken that primary? You know, I have to give the caveat that, you know, I work for Sue. Sue's a friend of mine. Um, but honestly, I don't think – I think anything would have been close. They they had the money. They had the turnout machine. They had the unions. Yeah. You now see Harris emails basically threatening their employees to go vote and how to vote. So the turnout would have been there. Isn't that illegal? But – that's a question for you know an FEC lawyer, somebody better than mine. On the surface, in my opinion, as an individual, it seems illegal to me. But again, election laws fill rooms, so I don't right. you know I don't know exactly what they cross. But I don't think they could have done the job of convincing the voters that Sue Loudon was going to take away Grandma's Social Security and and kick the autistic kids out in the street and right. and do those things. I don't think they could have hung that tag around Sue. So I think Sue would have ran a very competitive race. And for the same stretch, I think Danny would have run a more competitive race. Not to, and I'm not here to beat up on Sharon. I mean, Sharon uh, was our party's nominee. She's a strong conservative. Every Republican in the state would have been very proud of the way she voted had she got to the U.S. Senate. Uh, there just was a little sidetracked by a lot of things that really weren't the issues. So how do you feel about the – I know we touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but how do you feel about the Secretary of State race? Um. Well, yeah, this is my chance to respond and say I had nothing to do with uh, putting Rob Lauer in any race of any kind. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, again, and I'm putting on my David McGowan cap, my American for New Leadership cap we can put on later. But, you know, I think the voters got that one right. Um, you have to have a working, I mean, partisanship aside, you have to have a working knowledge of the job you're seeking. Right. And when he's making statements, you know, about things, you know, boards of elections that don't exist and and things related to election law that Ross Miller couldn't do if he wanted to do, you know, it, it, it isn't what's best for Nevada to turn those kind of jobs over strictly on nothing more than a partisan vote. Yeah, he lost by about 102,000 votes. Yeah. And those 102,000 folks that voted for him really didn't know the, the real Rob Lauer. They probably just saw an R and just went with it, you know. So let's take a break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to call out those uh, three raffle numbers, and uh, we're going to go right back to Dave McGowan, Field Director for Americans for New Leadership. This is Steve Sanson and Jim Jonas with Veterans in Politics. My name is Steve Sanson. I'm the president of Veterans in Politics International. This country and state are in trouble with budget cuts, unemployment, foreclosures, teacher shortage, dropout rates, terrorism, and a loss of military service members. The outcome of this election will profoundly affect families, both military and non-military. Military men and women are dying for other countries to have the right to vote. As a former member of the United States Marine Corps and the Army, I know how important it is to keep the voters informed. Log on to the website, veteransinpolitics.com. All Americans of voting age need to not only vote, but research your choices. The Veterans in Politics organization has taken a proactive approach to supporting candidates who will have the courage to protect all of our freedoms and our Constitution. Visit our website at veteransinpolitics.com. Don't just talk about who you support. Research your choices and vote. Hi, this 
This is Chuck Ann Baker, the editor of the Veterans Reporter newspaper, the only newspaper in Nevada for veterans and their families. Pick up your free copies at most VA offices, most libraries, at the American Legion, the VFW, the DAV, and hundreds of other locations. We also produce the Veterans Reporter radio show every Thursday night from 8 to 9 p.m., KLAV Radio, AM 1230. And we stream it live at www.klav1230am.com. This is Chuck Ann Baker for the Veterans Reporter Newspaper. Hi, I'm Travis Barrick, the Republican nominee for Attorney General, and I approve this message. Brian Krolicki received over 122,000 votes in the June primary, more than anybody else on the ballot. The lawsuit against him by Ms. Masto was a political witch hunt where she wasted thousands of your dollars. She has disgraced the Office of Attorney General by being a partisan hack of Harry Reid, and their socialist agenda is too radical for Nevada. You have the right to expect better of your Attorney General, and I have the integrity to deliver on that expectation. Go to TravisBurick.com to learn more about me and my campaign. Well, we are back. This is Steve Sanston and Jim Jonas with Veterans in Politics. Live in studio, Dave McGowan, Field Director for Americas for New Leadership. But before we go on to Dave, I have to call out uh, three numbers. We had uh, a little election, call it election donation pool. And um, we have uh, first, second, and third place winners. So if anybody, if all you folks that are listening, and I'm sure you're listening because you, you want some money, um, you probably want to get your little raffle tickets out. First place winner for the $200 is number 28. Three, five, four, seven. Once again, first place winner for two hundred dollars is two, eight, three, five, four, seven. Now this person got all the assembly races correct. You imagine that? That's amazing. Out of forty-six <clears throat> races, this person only missed two. Hmm. Two. That that I mean, what, what do they know? Uh, <laughs> they, they they know something. Yeah. Yeah. Second prize for fifty bucks. Numbers zero nine six seven three nine. Fifty bucks. Number zero nine six seven three nine. And the third place winner for twenty five dollars. Hold on to your seat. Number zero nine six seven three five. Zero nine six seven three five, and for those folks that wants to redeem their cash prizes, please give me a call at seven zero two two eight three eight zero eight eight two eight three eight zero eight eight. If you don't call me, I'm going to use that money to pay for veterans and politics bills, and we got some bills from this last election. Those YouTube videos was quite pricey. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back over. To Dave McGowan, Field Director for Americans for New Leadership. Dave, why don't you tell us about your organization? Uh, Americans for New Leadership is, and I always try to get these FEC things right, it's a federal, unauthorized, unconnected committee. It's, it's the type of organization that sprang out of the Supreme Court decision last January, Citizens United against the Federal Election Commission. That said unions, businesses, corporations could once again, you know, get back into the um, the political game as far as you know advocating for issues advocating for for candidates um so this group was formed by a bunch of people it is about a conservative message it's not about you know a straight party republican message um it's about helping and supporting candidates that we believe push a conservative uh message and belief system you know in the federal races we were one of the first groups to get up on the air in Nevada in defense of Sharon. We ran a spot, you know, trying to push back on the Social Security attacks that she was going under and did some other things, um, did some things for, for, for Joe Heck. And what we're, you know, trying to look at becoming is, you know, the conservative version for move on, you know, to, to move on dot org, same kind of organization, only with integrity and principles. Um, to put together the kind of messaging apparatus that, that the other side 
had dominated at. And I think that's one of the things they were most upset about this cycle is they lost that advantage. Yeah. You know, Republicans got organized on our side. So um, that's a little background of the, of the group. Um, how, how long has the group been in existence? A matter of months. I mean, it was created this cycle. Is that why so, there's only one uh, page on uh, the Yeah, end? that's all a work in progress. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, it's not going. Is it is it going to um, um, do a, like a voter registration, get out the vote type of deal, register people to vote? We're going to focus uh, more on the active, more on the activism end, uh, educate on issues, um, turn out voters. Um, we're never going to pass up a chance to you know to do voter registration. So how did you vote on question number one? I voted no straight across the board on okay. the questions. Okay, so it's going to be something like that. Um, questions come up on the ballot, educate the public on the questions, and try to have them lean towards your way, like vote no on question number one, because yes. let's not take away the rights f uh, from the people to vote. Now, who, who made that one? That's probably John Ralston made that <laughs> John Ralston. You know, me and him got into a fight over that. Well, it's amazing. They show, like, one or two examples where the people got it wrong on judges. Elizabeth Halverson. Right. Not to be confused with Elizabeth Halseth on any level, but Elizabeth Halverson... I well, hope not. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, did, did the voters get it wrong there? Well, I mean, obviously, but you act, they act like turning it over to the politicians guarantees a 100% success rate. You know, That's if my choices are between the people and the politicians making the decisions, right. I'm far more happy with the people and the occasional mistake than the situations you'd get if it became yeah. a pay-for-play favoritism right. Type operations. So like I'm on the judicial committee. Uh, my my son just got uh, DUI. Uh, you you might want to help him out with that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I know. I know how. It and works. like you said, I mean, that's one of those times where the, the problem to that is increased education of the voter on who the judicial candidates are. Right. Not taking the decision away from them. Maybe you can do some things. Maybe you know every judicial candidate after the primary can be given a website. I mean, if you don't want them to have such a financial burden, can be given a website, you right. know, can be given a, a fact sheet can be mailed. I mean, something like that. I, I'd be looking towards more increasing voter education than just taking away their choice. Right. So, so how does people know about this organization, Dave? What are you doing to promote it? Uh, we have an, you know, we have a large active email list that we're emailing people to. Um, we kind of started it, uh, with you know, six years gives me a lot of friends and a lot of connections. In, in that, we we brought a lot of the people that I trust and respect in, and they helped us do things. Um, we're going to move forward with some different kinds of marketing. Looking to you know, looking to increase our membership, um, kind of build some of the infrastructure, so that uh, you know, 2012, less than two years away, the presidential stuff start up in you know six eight months. We want to be. We want to have, you know, we want to have the boots on the ground. We want to have some of the organizations so that we can really counteract, you know, what will be if President Obama is their nominee, will be, you know, another huge, massive effort put in in the 2012 election. So, Dave, if a candidate comes to you and wants wants your group's help, uh, is there any kind of litmus test that you give that candidate? Well, um, we're you know we're an unauthorized, unconnected committee. A candidate can't come to us. Okay. We can't coordinate on any level. I mean, we can't even go to their office and pick up their signs to distribute. We have to stay completely separate. So then, what we do is we look at the we look at the candidates that have put themselves out there, okay. and then we kind of put our uh, litmus test, kind of a strong word, but you know, in the end, are they limited government conservatives? Are right. They you know. Reduce spending? Are they lower taxes? Are they personal responsibility? Um, those candidates will be happy to go out in races where we think it's close and where we think we, we can make a difference. We'll be happy to go out and you know get active. You ever heard of that organization? It's called um, Go Get Out the Vote, something like that, or Gotcha. Something I forget the name. Are of you that talking right. about? You might be talking about Goo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get ever out heard of, of that? House? Yeah. Uh, get out of our house. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, uh -huh. they're trying to get rid of all the um, House Republican or the House. Everybody in the house and replace them all with new folks. Or is it going to be some type of organization like this that is just want to replace everybody? No, absolutely not. I mean that, you know, that to me isn't productive. It isn't effective. You have great individuals. I mean, again, I believe Republican Party voters are intelligent individuals that can look at individuals and decide: Has that person lived up to the, the things that they campaigned on? Has that person advanced? you know, conservative values and make a decision to keep them where they have. There's a lot of amazing individuals on our side in the House of Representatives and the Senate that I would hate to see 
Paul Ryan, Michelle Bachman, Thad McCotter. I would hate to see those guys caught up. And Nancy effort. Pelosi. Um... Just to... <laughs> Nancy, uh, Nancy's a special case. Uh, I think the Republicans said it best when uh, she's indicated now that she'll stay and, and run for minority leader. And they yeah. said, we hope she does. She's got a great record on creating jobs for Republican lawmakers. Yeah, that was good. So I, I'm not stealing that. I'm giving credit to the Republican leadership on that. But... Yeah, I hope Nancy has a long career. So, so do you plan to go to D.C. to promote this, or, or, what, or is this going to be a, like a nationwide um, organization that you're running here? Oh, you know, obviously, obviously that's the goal. Um, there's a lot of states, you know, that are going to be active next cycle. The Republicans have a beautiful roadmap in the Senate next cycle. We only have 10 seats that are up, one of them that I think is in any real danger. So we have a chance to go out. And, you know, seats in Virginia and seats that we lost in 2006 solely because of the atmosphere, the atmosphere was anti-Republican. But I think it easily put us at a 53 or 54 seat Republican Senate. And if we team that with a Republican House and a strong Republican presidential candidate, then we really have uh, Americans have gotten new leadership. And we can really look forward to fixing these, you know, fixing the real problems that we have. So, Dave, what do you say to some of the comments that I hear on? Different uh, news stations at, uh, following the election results stating that uh, the Republicans got a second chance here. They better not blow it. Do you feel the same way? I, I absolutely feel the same way. I don't. Uh, this election, I feel like conservatives won a lot. I feel like individual Republican candidates won races. I don't feel like the Republican Party has won anything yet. I feel now they've really entered in the game they can win, and that is to govern conservatively. Yeah. If they do the things they run on, if they reduce spending, if they do everything they can to defund, repeal, gut that horrific health care bill, right. if they stand up and run the things, I think they can win a huge, you know, a huge victory moving forward. I think then they will increase majorities, and I think they'll win the presidency. I mean, Tea Party or not, Republican or not, people said enough. Right. People voted against members of the House that had been there for decades that had run their whole career, Oberstar in Minnesota, Spratt in South Carolina, on look what I bring back, look at the goodies I bring home, look right. at all the... The people said, we don't care about that anymore yeah. because that breaks our government. Right. So there's a big, huge conservative uh, wave out there that now Republicans can take, and they can turn it into a huge victory. They can turn it into you know, a 30-year, 40-year dominance of government if they govern conservatively. You're absolutely right, Jim. So what race will this org concentrate on? Next election cycle? Yeah. Um, I can promise you you'll be one of the shows we come back on first and talk about it, but it's way early for us to look at. You know, there are Senate races that we'll be. We'll be looking at defending, the, you know, the goals we've made here. You know the unions. You know the Democrats are going to come heavily back at Joe Heck. 2,000 votes has got to just burn them, burn them, you know, to the soul. So they'll be back, and we don't want to lose ground. But, you know, we need to see how things shape up. So it's basically going to be the federal races. No, um, none of the, That's the um, kind of committee that American for New Leadership is. Okay. It's a federal entity committee. N n none of the, um, the, the, the state races or, or the local races here? No, again, the laws doesn't structure okay. us. But you, we do believe by, you know, obviously we focus on turning out Republican voters. That doesn't hurt Well, let's, let, let's talk a right. little bit about Republican. I, I think that there's several different fashions of the Republican Party. You have, you have the, um, what, what they call the old guard. Mm -hmm. People that's been around. Um, um, well, one of the old guard used to be Sig, Rog Sig um, um, Rogage, Rogage. Rogage and, and, until he <laughs> backed Harry Reid, which 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 was I, I think was a sad sad day for us. And then you have the uh, the Tea Party folks um, um, who who are uh, heavily organized and and I don't know where they came from, but they just they came and they just keep marching forward. And then you have the, the regular, um, the regular Republican conservatives. That's not really a part of of anything. But how, how do you feel about these three fashions that that, that are going on? How, how do you how do you think that they could uh, become unified and, and work as a as one team instead of going in several different directions? Well, I think you know, I think you did a great job of breaking that down because a lot of people think it is two. It is either your old guard and your Tea Party. They don't acknowledge like you do the massive amount of Republicans in the middle that, you know, they're Republicans, they get active the last month before the election, yeah. but they don't intend to rally nine months out. They don't, 
go down and make phone calls. You know, they live their lives. They're Republicans. But the, the thing that unites all of us, you know, over the fighting and the bickering is a common goal, and that's limited government, and that's reducing spending, and that's, you know, giving our kids in America that's not $23 trillion in debt. And I think as we see the Republicans advance those agendas and those goals be met, it's the best way, I think, to bring those, those three sides together. If they see that, you know, even though they maybe started out rowing against each other, now slowly they're rowing towards that same goal and see those things happen, they'll, uh, you know, they will be coming together. But Jim's absolutely right. If the old entrenched guard Republicans, you know, start, I, I'm so upset to hear this word compromise this week. You know, there is no compromising on the issues that face us. You can compromise on whether you have steak or chicken for dinner. Right. But not whether you spend a billion, a trillion dollars in debt and then, oh, well, we'll back that down to $500 billion. Right. That's not compromise. I don't want to see those things. If we go forth with a bold agenda to reduce spending, that will bring the parties better than anything else. And the, th- and the thing that uh, I was talking to a friend about who doesn't – he doesn't really understand that much about politics. He was he was laughing because he was like, oh, you guys thought you were going to win the Senate, and you didn't. I said, nah, most people thought it would be close. But if I have to take the House or the Senate, I want the House. Absolutely. Because then we control spending. All so spending all spending yep. right from the House. So I think it was a bigger – even though the Democrats are trying to downplay it as not being the landslide people thought it was, if you look at the numbers in the House – the American people have spoken really clearly. Was that about 60 seats? Yeah. Somewhere around there? 60, uh, 61 and counting. There's yeah. still some yeah. messes out there. And, you know, understanding politics like we do, we, we, did, we did on some level take control of the Senate. We have 46, may end up with 47 yeah. senators. But more importantly than that, we have 41 strong conservatives. We can, we can, we can filibuster. That's we, the key, We can put a stop. Now to anything we don't want going through the Senate. We don't have to worry about, you know, when we were right at 41 and we needed every 41, we had to worry about the Olympia Snows and the Susan Collins right. and all these people that run their own program in the Republican Party. They can run their own program and we can go back to our conservative base and say, this isn't what the people want. This isn't what the people want. Let's stop this now. So, I mean, Harry goes back, unfortunately, but he goes back greatly, greatly weakened in his ability to get things done. And I believe... With, you know, the clock is ticking, he has less than two years as majority leader because if you look at the map for 2012, we're in an excellent position in the Senate. So what do you think that – how did Joe Heck pull it out? What did he do differently that Porter didn't – besides, I mean, we all know that, you know, it was just a Democrat year in 2008. But I heard rumors that uh, John just got out of touch with the voters, got a little bit arrogant. How did uh, Joe Heck not uh, have that happen to him? Because that was a tough district for him to win. Yeah, I mean, Democrats had a huge uh, voter registration edge over uh, Dr. Heck. They poured an unbelievable amount of money and get out the vote in the unions and, and their buses and, and those efforts. Um, first of all, you know, Joe Heck's a friend of mine, and I think he's an amazing individual. Doctor, businessman, served his country, you know, veteran, took time out of campaigns, you know, he— May have lost the state senate race because he spent months overseas. Right, with his opponent. Um, again, I think it was the message. You know, I think he had the pedigree that you needed as a candidate, and that he had the message: we can't continue on this road. You right. know, and Congresswoman Titus went out there unabashedly. I'm proud of the stimulus; it worked. I was there at a debate when she said it created 3.2 million jobs. <laughs> I mean, where, who? I mean, yeah, exactly. by their own. By their own estimation, their own website, it created 387 jobs in CD3 at the cost of almost $400,000 a job. So I think Joe just, Joe just took that message. No so, spending, no, you know, low taxes to stimulate government and fix health care. So do you think Joe is going to stick on the conservative message this time? I mean, not saying he hasn't in the past. I'm just saying that when he was a state senator, there were a lot of people that thought he was a little bit too moderate of a Republican. Not a rhino, so to speak, but a little bit too moderate in some of his voting record. So, again, you know, saying that, that Joe's a friend, I think he will. Yeah. I think that, you know, all these new guys go to Washington, D.C. with a rearview mirror, you know, on their desk looking yeah. behind. There's a big, huge organization that will rally. There's a big, huge organization, of, maybe not organization, a movement of Tea Party people that if they see you wander in the wilderness, they will, they will start rallies. They will start an organization. 
So um, having said that, I don't see a problem with Joe. The Republicans are going to have a dynamite team in the House with strong conservative leadership. Our biggest problem last time we got the House was after Newt. We had Denny Hastert, and Denny Hastert was all about deals and all about that. Boehner's all about a message. And I think Joe will be thrilled to be on that team, and we'll be proud of him once he's there. Well, I'm thrilled that he sent uh, Dina back to teaching. I'm not so sure it's good for our kids, but it's at least better for our pocketbooks. All right, let's take a uh, quick break. This is Steve Sanson and Jim Jonas with Veterans in Politics. And we'll be back momentarily with Dave McGowan, noisy Dave McGowan, field director for Americans for New Leadership. The Veterans in Politics International. The Veterans in Politics mission is to teach, educate, organize, and awaken our veterans and their families to select, support, and vote intelligently for a better world and to protect ourselves from our own government in a culture of corruption and to be the political voice for those and other groups that do not have one. Remember, one in six veterans are vet. There are too many homeless vets and more programs are needed at the VA. Every veteran service organization post should adopt a local homeless veterans. Funding of VA medical centers is inadequate, and building a VA hospital in Southern Nevada is moving at a slow pace. The budget has been flatlined for too many years. The VA is too quick to deny claims and too slow to help veterans gather records in support of claims. Local politicians ignore veterans and their issues. They perceive a lack of organization among their local veterans and that it won't hurt them in election time. The veterans too often vote party, not veterans issues. All veterans should vote in every election. Local news media give adequate coverage to local veteran issues and events. You must send your letters to the editor and voice your concerns. Please contact your members of Congress and Senate and urge them to co-sponsor key legislation in supporting our veterans. Please support the Veterans in Politics. To get more information, go online to www.veteransinpolitics.com. Support your local veteran groups. Well, we're back. This is Steve Sanson and Jim Jonas with Veterans in Politics. And uh, we got Dave McGowan. He's the field director for Americans for New Leadership. So, Dave, anything else you want to say about this organization? Yeah, like I said, uh, you know, it's something that's, that's, that's near and dear to my heart. I think it's one place, it's one of the ways Republicans, conservatives can really get back in the game. It's, it's ground that, that the Democrats have, have capitalized on, you know, since the creation of Move On. We're going to be doing a lot of things moving forward to, you know, increase our membership, get keep the grassroots involved, you know, keep that big movement going. Um, so maybe, you know, months down the road, we got some more things going. I'd like to come back and talk about those individual activities. Oh, very cool, Jim. No, oh, Dave, I just want to say it's been a while since I've seen you. I want to say thank you very much for all your hard work getting Republicans elected. And uh, I wish your organization all the luck. It sounds like a wonderful idea. And, and anytime you need me to get involved with that, I'd be more than happy to. Yeah, Dave, why don't you give us your point of contact or the contact to the um, the new org? Um, anybody wants to reach out, can just go ahead and reach out to me at my email, which is davidlv702 at gmail.com. Um, I'll be happy to get back with you, put you on an email list. Talk to you about new and upcoming events so you see ways we, maybe you can fit into our organization. Okay. Thank you so much, Dave, for coming on the show. Thank you, guys. Well, I hope uh, everybody knows that uh, we're finally going to get a USO. Uh, it's going to be a ribbon-cutting ceremony, Jim. Ribbon-cutting ceremony. Go time. November 11th, McCarran Airport. It's by A and B Gates, and I believe the time for that is at 2 p.m., not positive. You probably want to check with uh, with the um, McCarran Airport or the uh, USO director for that. Make sure the time is right. But I believe it's 2 p.m. 
because 2 p.m. was tentative. And all your famous politicians are going to be there taking credit for that uh, USO, by the way. <laughs> you know, they always do. They always try to take credit for it. But, you know, we have a USO. We always wanted one. Yep. Now our troops have a place to hang out and, uh, and uh, rest their heads and not be bothered by civilian types. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what? When I got back from Desert Storm, you know what the first thing a civilian asked me when I landed in Jersey? No. Did you kill anybody? <laughs> I wanted to slap the dog doo-doo right <laughs> off his face, let me tell you. You go to combat, what do you expect to do? Throw a rock? Yeah. You know? And we don't use the word kill anyways. Defending our country, defending our freedom, defending our democracy. So that's a better terminology to, to, to put it. No, nobody wants to use that kill word. But anyway, this is Steve Sanson and Jim Jones with Veterans of Politics.